If you're thankful for his promises, would you say amen? Amen, amen. amen. I'm just going to set this mic right over here uh, on that, on those coil of cords if anybody needs it at the end of the service. Um, if you want to take your Bible and turn with me to Judges chapter number 21. Judges chapter number 21 is where we're going to be. Judges chapter 21. And as you're turning there, I do want to commend you as a church, as a unified body. I do want to commend you for your spirit this week, for your attendance this week, uh, for the sacrifices that you've made this week. Um, uh, I am, uh, it is very, very obvious this is a, uh, a church full of really, really good people. This is a community full of good people. And uh, I just want to commend you for that, and uh, I hope the Lord blesses you for it. I really do. I also want you to know that uh, I've been praying for y'all as a church and as a body um, since Pastor Drew asked me to preach uh, back in May, I think it was, and he sent me a Facebook message, and um, you know, I, I, I felt pretty certain at that point that that's what the Lord wanted us to do. So I went ahead and accepted. And since that time, I've just pr been praying for y'all off and on. And uh, specifically coming into the meeting, uh, I want you to know that I've been praying a lot for y'all and a lot for your pastor and a lot for your pastor's wife and a lot for this community uh, because God is going to, and it's not Judges 21, it's Joshua 21. I just, I'm an idiot. Um, I just looked down at Judges 21, and I was like, that's definitely not the passage. So it's Joshua 21, and uh, I apologize for that. They both start with J. Um, it's easy to get mixed up. Um, yeah, let me see, Joshua 21, yeah. Jeremiah, wherever you want to go. I don't know, John, who cares? There's four of them. Um, no, but I did want to commend you all and um, want you to know that we'll continue to pray for you all. And... Um, and I, I, you, can, you can sense um, the season that churches are in when you come to them. And I really believe that this church is primed for something really special. All right, now you've got you to gotta hear that correctly. I, I don't know much about this church. I don't know much about the history of the church. Y'all might be like, we're always special. I, of course. But I'm just saying you can always... You can just always sense uh, shifts in things, and I, I really feel like this church is about to take a step forward uh, for the Lord Jesus, and so I'm excited for y'all. I'm, I'm a little bit bummed that I have to fly out tomorrow morning. I felt like I've made some really good friends. Uh, there is, this humidity doesn't exist in Virginia, so I'm really, we have these beautiful things called mountains and trees that give you fresh oxygen. I felt like I've been suffocating the majority of the time that I've been here. And I, uh, I've been on WebMD numerous times. Is this normal? Yeah, it's just humidity. It's like, ugh. And uh, so I've had fun here, but y'all can have it. I'm going back to Virginia. Um, but I want y'all to know that I'm, I'm leaving a piece of my heart here, and I, I, I look forward to the day that we can, I get to come back, and, and not so um, we can do ministry here. That's, that's totally up to Pastor Drew and his purview. But um, so w w I can see what my wife and I have been talking about that we think is about to happen at this church. Um, and I just want to challenge y'all to be faithful. Uh, I want to challenge you as if you were my own. I just, I, I don't, I just, when people ask me to preach, I just want to be a pastor. And I just want to be, you know, a Christian brother that encourages people in the word. And uh, I want to encourage y'all to just keep the faith. I want to encourage y'all to pray. Uh, I want to encourage y'all that, yes, if there is revival, like we talked about last night, there might be some battles for this church or this community, uh, but they're worth fighting. Um, it's all of my children are worth having. Now, my beautiful wife had to go through great travail for that, but I'm so glad that she did. So don't be scared of travail or striving because great things usually end on the other side of that. And so have deep faith. And then also, he's not going to say this, rally around your pastor and rally around his wife and his kids. Um, it's, it, a pastor's never gonna get up and preach a message on how to encourage me. But um, don't be a discourager. Don't be one of the, if you wanna stop revival, be a discouragement to your pastor. All right, so as we come to revival and we say we want the Lord to move, if you want to 
uh, hold back a movement of the Holy Ghost. Um, don't encourage your pastor and his wife. They didn't put me up to this. I relish in the fact of being in other men's pulpits and telling their people to encourage them and love on them. I grew up a pastor's kid, and I saw the weight that my daddy carried. I know the weight that I carry, and he keeps a smile on, and those beautiful blue little baby eyes that he has um, will, will tell you that all is okay, but he's a man, and his wife is just a woman made of flesh like we are, and so continue to encourage them, and I'm so looking for, I really believe that y'all are, um, this church is just primed. It, it's, uh, um, and I also want to uh, uh, um, say how awesome it is that, uh, so two weeks ago, we, I, I read Psalm chapter 150. I read Psalm 50, and we were about to sing the hymn by Matt Boswell and the Gettys entitled Psalm 150. And I looked back at our video booth, and we had gone over this and over this and over this and over this, and the song just didn't start playing. And this was the very beginning of the service. Man, we came into it and the song didn't start playing and we waited there for like 60 seconds. It was awesome. It was awesomely awkward, all right? And so when that happened, I was like, ha, it's your turn now. (laughs) Um, But I don't know who started it, but I believe that that was a test from the Lord to say, do you need stuff to have revival? Because all you need is his word and a voice. And someone started singing, and this I believe that that song could have not been sang any better, and that led us into his mercy is more. And so there's some health in this church, so safeguard that, support your under-shepherd, and if if you can't do that, ask God to give you grace to do that, all right? Um, This is a special place, and uh, I look forward to monitoring from afar um, with with pure mountain air, and... um, (laughs) Here in the next few weeks, everything will be bright red and bright yellow and orange, and we pick our own pumpkins and apples and peaches. It is the most beautiful thing in the world. So y'all can have every bit of what you have down here. And, uh, but I just want to encourage y'all in that manner. And um, tonight we're going to be talking, it kind of feels like it's in the same vein as the previous two nights, but I just want y'all to know again, I, I came down with maybe five to seven messages kind of loaded up not knowing how the chamber, what was going to come out of the uh, barrel each day. And you can ask my wife, just, uh, I walked around Camp Gilead today, just like, Lord, what would you have me give these people? Uh, I've got three or four messages, what do you want? And I know he led me to this message that I was able to preach right after Easter to my own people. So again, I just, I'm bringing you the feed that I've, I've given my sheep. We're not doing anything special here. And, um, and I think it's a good timing one. Because as we pray for revival, then God begins to give us more of himself, more of his spirit, more illumination, more manifestation of his power, more enlightening of the eyes through his word. As God begins to do that and enemies begin to be defeated and great things begin to happen and this church begins to grow from the inside out and bear fruit for for uh, all of eternity, as that happens, as all those blessings happen, um, Satan's choice weapon against or within Satan's choice weapon found within the seasons of blessings for the people of God is misunderstanding. Misunderstanding. He loves it. Just a little miscommunication. Just a little misunderstanding. Just a little, just a little, a little bit of this. A little, what did they mean by that? Just a little bit of hearsay. That, oh man, it's, it's like a, Who was it? Um, The person in the Old Testament who tied the foxtails together and then he lit them on fire and he made them run throughout the Philistine. Was that Samson? I think that was Samson. It's like when Samson, um, he grabbed two foxes and he tied their tails together and he lit the tails on fire and the foxes went throughout the, the, the wheat fields of the Philistines and burned all the fields down. That's what Satan does. Satan just brings two little foxes together, ties their tail together, lights a little bit of misunderstanding, and he'll send them throughout all those crops that y'all are about to see because you're praying for revival. And so you're about to see some upgrowth, and I'm just telling you, I'll be celebrating with you because I know what's about to happen, but I want to be someone who's like, hey, watch your six because Satan don't let crops grow without coming after them. It's, he just doesn't do it. It's It's... It's too dangerous to his kingdom to allow y'all just to see revival in this community. Because when this church sees revival, marriages are revived, families are revived, communities revived, this state's revived. Politics aren't going to do it. 
Well, this is primaries. Who cares? They all put Jesus on the cross, all right? Primaries, elections, they're not going to do it, all right? The Spirit of God through the people of God and the Word of God is going to do it. And when the devil starts seeing those things come together like it's happening at faith, watch out for some great misunderstandings, some great misunderstandings. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to read, let's, just, let's start reading in chapter number 22, actually, of Joshua, Joshua 22. And um, I'll see how far I get into this chapter. Might paraphrase a little bit. So Joshua 22, verse 1. Then Joshua called the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh. And he said unto them, You have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, and you have obeyed my voice in all that I commanded you. You have not left your brethren these many days unto this day, but you've kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God is giving rest unto your brothers as he promised them. Now you can return and go to your own tents and under the land of your possession, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of Jordan. But you need to take diligent heed to the commandment and to the law, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, charged you. That's found in Deuteronomy chapter 30. And he charged them there to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and to cleave unto him and serve him with all of your heart and your soul. So Joshua blessed them and sent them away, and they went to their own tents. Now, to the one half of the tribe of Manasseh, Moses gave possession. So verses 7, uh, seven through 9 talk about how these two and a half tribes that Joshua was telling to go back to the other east side of Jordan, what they had been given. Uh, they were ranchers, they were farmers. The land was very, very, very fertile on um, that side of Jordan. And so they requested that side of the land before they came over and helped seize the inheritance. And Joshua was sending them back over. Verses seven through nine talk about that. Verse 10. And when they came under the borders of Jordan, they, the two and a half tribes of Israel that were to dwell on the east side, uh, that are in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh, there's the two and a half. They built an altar on that bank of Jordan, a great altar to see to. And the children of Israel heard say, I'm a little hot. Could you pull me down just a little bit on this mic here? Because if I get to preach it, I'm going to hurt my own ears. And the children of Israel heard say, that's where we get the term hearsay. They heard something. Behold, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh, they built an altar over against the land of Canaan and the borders of Jordan at the passage of the children of Israel. And when the children of Israel heard of it, the whole congregation of the children of Israel. Now that's the other nine and a half tribes. Okay, again, we have 12 tribes of Israel. Two and a half are set to live on this side. The other nine and a half on this side. Manasseh, the river runs right down through Manasseh, this huge tribe, okay? So when the nine and a half heard that the two and a half had built an altar, hearsay, the whole congregation, verse 12, gathered themselves together at Shiloh to go to war against them. Now, if you write in your Bibles, circle or underline them and write out beside it family. Because this isn't just any other person, man. These nine and a half tribes have heard something about the other two and a half tribes of their family of their brothers and their sisters, of their comrades that they had just fought with all these years to secure the promise of, of God in the land. And they heard something and they immediately, hastily took up arms to go to war with their family. Night one, disciples dispute. Night two, who are you going to battle with? To get, so you can't be lulled to sleep with them. That's their brothers and family. That's the people who their kids played with. That's the people who brought barbecue chicken on night three of revival. That's the lady who makes the best mac and cheese. That's like nobody. That's, that's the same people. Those are the people who did VBS with them. Those are the people who went to revival with them. That them? How callously do we talk about the rest of the family of God in our church? And the children of Israel sent unto the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the two and a half tribes under the land of Gilead, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar the priest, and with him ten princes, verse 15. And that group led by Phinehas, they came unto the children of the two and a half tribes, and they spake to them, saying, verse 16, Thus saith the whole congregation of the Lord, What trespass is this? What you doing over here? A little misunderstanding that you have committed against the Lord God of Israel to turn away this day from following the Lord, and that you have built an altar that you might rebel this day against the Lord. You notice they didn't even ask them. 
what they were doing? You notice that? They didn't even ask him. They didn't give him the benefit of the doubt. This was haste. This was harsh. This was heavy-handed. They just went over there, led by Phineas. They put some well-respected men up to it, and they led this army over. Said, why are you sinning over here? They didn't even say, hello, how are y'all doing? That you might rebel against the Lord. Assumption ten, uh, tends to make fools out of us. Verse 17. Is the iniquity of Peor too little for us from which we are not cleansed? Although there was a plague in the congregation of the Lord, I need to tell you what that is. In Numbers chapter number 25, the iniquity of Peor. Thank y'all for putting that up there. The iniquity of Peor. In Numbers chapter number 25, the Bible says that Israel went a whoring after the gods of the Midianites. Uh, or I think it was the Moabites, sorry, in Moab. And um, like 20, 22,000 people, I believe, 22, 20, 25,000 people died because they started um, worshiping other gods, so God sent a plague amongst them. So this verse that talks about that plague in the congregation of the Lord, um, a couple dozen thousand people died under the wrath of God, and Phineas was the one who put a t stop to it. This Phineas, who's leading this group over. So Phineas has seen a lot, okay? He's kind of got a little bit of credibility to him. God even commends Phineas, and he comes over. He said, what are you doing? What do you think you're doing over here? We heard what you're doing over here. Where, look, they didn't even have a conversation. No cup of coffee here. We heard what you were doing. First red flag. We heard what you were doing. We didn't see it, but we heard about it. What are you doing over here that you're sinning? Is God not killing 25,000 people enough for you? Do you want his hand to come back on us for worshiping other idols? That's what they're assuming. There's this massive misunderstanding here. Verse 18. You must turn away this day from following the Lord, and it will be that you, seeing you rebel today against the Lord, that tomorrow he'll be mad at all of us. Verse 19. Notwithstanding. Uh, verse 19 and 20 says this. If your land is clean and not good enough to dwell in, you can come over with us. Isn't that often what people do while they're arguing within a misunderstanding? Our side's way better. Our side's way better. We heard what you were doing over here. How dare you sin? How dare you do that? If your side's not good enough, our side's exactly what you need. Oh, my soul. This don't sound like an argument within a church, verse 21. Then the children of Reuben, the two and a half tribes, said in verse 22, the Lord God of gods, the Lord God of gods, he knows, and Israel shall know. If it be in rebellion or a transgression against the Lord, save us not this day, that we've built an altar to turn from the Lord or to offer therein burnt offering or meat offering or peace offerings thereon, let the Lord himself require it. And then verse 24 through 34, let me paraphrase the rest of the chapter, says this. Miss Logan, they said, if this, what you're accusing us of is legit, we call on the God of heaven to show you and to get after us. But... How about you slow your roll, Phineas? Listen, you want to know why the altar's over here? You came in like a bull in a china shop accusing us of all this kind of stuff in front of our kids. So how about you just calm down? Because a fool is quick to anger. We need to be slow to wrath, Phineas. So I'm glad you got all this credibility in Israel, but you're super duper mad and you need to calm down. You want to know what this altar's about? Number one, if it's bad, we trust that God's going to catch up to us. Because it's not bad. The reason we built this altar, Phineas, 24 through 34, the reason we built this altar is because our kids are going to grow up on a different side of the river that your kids are. Our kids are not going to know your kids. Our next generation is not going to know your next generation because we've got our life over here, you've got your life over there. Yes, we're the same nation, but they're not going to know each other. And here's what we're afraid of, that your kids are going to grow up and find a boat and come over to this side of the river and tell us our kids don't have an angle on God like your kids do. And we're really, really scared that your kids are going to mistreat our kids like you're mistreating me. Ooh, that's powerful. I got goosebumps in my armpits on that one. That's really good. We're afraid that the next generation is going to do this mess right here, man. We just went over there and fought with you all those years. Who do you think was? We left our wives and kids over here for five years to fight with you. We were with you shoulder to shoulder. Gideon's 300 men, we were part of those that you picked to go to battle. And you're going to come over here and say this in front of our kids, man? After all that we've been through together, you're going to do this over some misunderstanding? 
No, we built this to the same Jehovah God that you build your altars to, man. It's okay. Why don't you give us a little bit of trust? And Phineas said, accepted. Perfect. That's all we needed to know. And he went back over the river, and a civil war was stayed. A misunderstanding almost split a family right in half. Almost destroyed them. Can you imagine if, this, if Satan's misunderstanding in this chapter would have gone through? Can you imagine if it would have gone through? Well, I don't know how the, what big of an impact it would have. We were in Judges last night. And in Judges, God raised up a man named Gideon. And who does he call to the battle? The tribe of Manasseh. These guys who are about to kill each other. Manasseh, Asher, Nebulun. Uh, Zebulun and uh, Naphtali. If they'd have gone to civil war, who would have showed up to help Gideon? The 300 from last night would have been compromised if this stupidity would have gone through. Satan knows how to crank up a misunderstanding and set it loose within the body of Christ. And we have to be ready as godly grace field. Now, I'm sure they were a lot more grace field than I was when I was being smart out to Phineas just now. That, 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 that's ridiculous to me. I'm sure that they were much nicer. But we have to be grace-filled. We have to be knowledgeable of the Word because when those misunderstandings, and they undoubtedly will, when they reach Faith Baptist Church's shores, who's going to be the person that diffuses it? Who are going to be the godly people that diffuse it? Who are going to people be the people in this community that diffuse mis? Who's going to finally be the person in your family that diffuses misunderstandings? Nobody can get together anymore as families because we all fight like cats and dogs. Who's this is what I tell my people at Wayside? Who's going to finally be the person in your family tree that stands up and does what's right and and speaks from the word and speaks from the heart and says this is not right. We've got to stop it. Who's going to be the person in your workplace that finally diffuses all those misunderstandings that are putting people on teams? Who's going to do that? Someone has to. Well, Phineas is going to do that. Well, obviously, Phineas was cross-eyed on this one. So you watch. You can't always lean on the people that you've always leaned on to do what's right. Because Phineas was about to start a stinking civil war. So I'm glad that you got victories back there, Phineas. But you got this one wrong, bro. Remember last night we said, this battle, who are you picking to go into battle that sits right in front of you? And tonight, just really quickly, hopefully with the help of the Lord, with his pace and his grace, I just want to talk to you about when the disciples start disputing, when we go to battle, night one, night two, comes into tonight, um, how are we going to handle misunderstandings? Because we guard ourselves as a church against the misappropriation of funds, the big ones. We guard ourselves against the church of people taking advantage of our kids. We guard ourselves at the church with background checks, and we guard ourselves with the church with wolves and sheep's clothing coming in. But what we often do is we leave a little bit of sliver open for misunderstandings to creep in. And yes, our kids are safe. And yes, there's nothing on the news about our church. And yes, there's nothing in the national headlines about what went down and what got covered up. And thank goodness for that. But we're eaten up within the body of Christ with misunderstandings. Hey, and it's not just here. I guarantee you every church in this county and in this state needs to misunderstand. I, my people, like I guess I had to preach this to my people. Myself, preachers. This is what preachers do to each other. They eat each other alive. Oh, well, did you see what color they painted their auditorium? We heard that you were going a little bit liberal. Heaven forbid you take them out for coffee and actually ask them what they believe about the Bible. But that's what we do. Here's what we do. I, I need everybody to get a hold of this. Here's what we do. Someone changes the lighting in one of their churches, and we get on Facebook, and we talk about the intent of what that church is doing. How in the devil do we know the intent of what that church is doing? That's a misunderstanding. That's hearsay. That's a heavy-handed, hasty assumption. And here's the thing. The world's watching. And we sit in our churches firing at each other because we believe that we have the best. And we got to look down and see that we are on 
fire ourselves with misunderstandings. And that's what I want to leave you all with tonight. Because I cannot wait to see what God does with this church and this community. and What he's already doing. But I want to put this in the back of your head. Watch out for misunderstandings. Lord, help me tonight to preach quickly. I love you and I praise you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Number one, I see the mercies of God. I see the mercies of God. I'm going to preach as quickly as I can. Deuteronomy closes with the death of Moses, the former leader. And Joshua opens with the installment of a new younger leader. Deuteronomy closes the chapter on an old leader. And Joshua opens this chapter of a new young leader. Joshua 1 through 5, people follow Joshua chapters 1 through 5. People follow Joshua, they go over Gilgal, they set up the monument, what meaneth these stones, that's when God brought us over Gilgal. They set their eyes on Jericho, they lay waste to that, they have Passover there at Gilgal, it's incredible. God's mercies are all over that thing. Um, Chapter 7 through 13, they conquer the land. They go throughout, they're warring with everybody. I mean, like 300 type stuff, and it's an incredible thing. If you think the Bible's boring, you just ain't read it ever. Uh, Chapter 7 through 13 is they are warring, and by God's goodness and mercy, they are winning. And then chapters 14 through 20-something, 20, right around in there, 21, they start parceling out the land of God's inheritance to all these tribes. And it ends with Caleb saying, I want that mountain. Joshua's like, all right, go get it, man. Caleb said, I want that as my inheritance. Now, Joshua and Caleb, you got to remember, those were the two spies that went in. Two spies came out of the promised land and said, we can do it. And ten came back with no faith and said, I don't think we can do it. And God said, because of your lack of faith, I'm going to make you wonder for 40 more years. And God had to sever the head off that entire generation. And the only two that could go in of that generation were Caleb and Joshua. God even had to take Moses down because Moses wouldn't lead by faith. God had to take Moses down because Moses wouldn't lead by faith. God had to take Moses down. But Moses, you think we know good people? Moses couldn't go any further because he wouldn't lead by faith. Joshua and Caleb make it over into the promised land. Joshua's now the leader. Caleb's this old man. When Caleb came out of the promised land with Joshua and said, we can take it, he was 40 years old. When he asked for that mountain, he was 85 years old. At the end of the inheritance, right before this passage we just read, he was 85. You take out the 40 years of them wandering in the wilderness, that leaves five years. That tells you that they warred for about five years to secure the promised land. And at the end of that, God started passing out all their land. and split. You've seen the maps of the 12 tribes of Israel splitting up all their land. And when they split up all the land, God said, the land has rest, the mercies of God. Here's all your inheritance. Here's all these victories. Look at Jericho. Look at all that I've done. Look at Gilgal. Look at those stones. Look at all that I've done. Those are my mercies. And on top of that, Joshua 14, 15, the land had rest from war. Joshua 18, 1, the land was subdued before the enemies. They were at peace. Joshua 21, right before we came into our passage, the Lord gave them rest, and there failed not any of the good thing which the Lord had spoken unto the house of Israel. All of it came to pass. By the mercies of God, they entered the promised land. They received their inheritance. They were now dwelling in peace with one another. Enemies were conquered. Possessions were divided. Everything that, watch, listen, watch. Everything that God promised would happen, happened. Life was good. And that's our life after Christ, if you think about it. We pass from death unto life. And there's not one good thing that's withheld from us. We live in peace. All of our enemies have been subdued. Life is good. But blessings have a way of lulling us to sleep. Blessings have a way of getting our guard down. In fact, at the very end of it all, right before um, Satan and the bear of the north and the underlying regions marched down on Israel and encamped there in Jezreel, Jezreel, and it's the battle of Armageddon that happens seven years after the rapture. We get out of here before the tribulation. It's the rapture, 
then we, we get out of here, marriage, supper of the Lamb, then the tribulation, then the battle of Armageddon, then Christ comes back on his white horse. That's Bible eschatology. And at that time in Armageddon, all these um, enemies are there in Jezreel about to take over Israel. How did they get there? Here's how they got there. The Bible says that in that time, Israel will have great peace. She'll be one of the world's leading economies. All the diaspora and the Jews that went throughout the earth, they're coming back to Israel. And the Jews are going to be so stinking blessed. That iron dome that protects them right now, those rockets that get shot into Israel, and that iron dome, one of the greatest military defenses of all time that only Israel has right now. You can't tell me that God didn't give that to them, by the way. They're still the apple of God's eye. They're still the greatest country on the face of the earth. Israel is insanely blessed by God. And the Bible says at the end of it all, they're going to be a little too blessed and they're going to lay their defenses down. They're going to sign a peace treaty with the Antichrist and he's going to march into the Valley of Jezreel. You know why? Because blessings have a weird way of lulling you to sleep. They have a weird way of making you comfortable. The mercies of God, we have so many of them. Oh, man, life is good. And in crawls a misunderstanding. I see the mercies of God, but then I see some movement. In verses 1 through 10, I see that the eastern tribes are moving back over to the other side. And I've explained that a little bit, but... This is not them backsliding. This is not a picture of them going back. Why are they crossing the river? I thought God brought them into the promised land. When Moses was still alive, these two and a half tribes asked for this fertile land because they had most livestock. This is, this is an agricultural thing. They had the most livestock, and they were like, Moses, can we live over here? And Moses was like, is the promised land not good enough for you? And they're like, no, 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 it's great, it's great, but can't the promised land be a little bit over here? Is that okay? And Moses was like, Deal. But when we do cross over, not me because i got to be dead, when Joshua crosses over with everybody, you need to leave the land that I'm going to give you right now, you two and a half tribes, and you need to cross over with them. And for those five years, you need to help them war and seize their land. And they're like, deal. But can we build our cities up a little bit because we're going to leave our livestock and our kids and our women in these cities. And so they built big walls around their cities. And then they said, all right, Joshua, we're good to go. And Joshua and them marched over Gilgal. And they were over there for five years. So when it was done, they just sat around for a few chapters and were like, ah, can y'all please hurry up with the passing out of inheritances? We want to go back home and see our wives and kids that we haven't seen in five years. I have not petted my favorite goat in five years. Can you hurry up the process, please? And they're just sitting around. You can just see them on rocks. They're just sitting around, and they're finally done. Caleb gets his mouth, and woo-hoo, old man, go ahead, great. And God says, go back over to the other side of the river. And so they're moving back over to this side of the river. There's this movement. They've come back to where God told them they were allowed to be. After about five years, the Bible says that these tribes went back to their tents, their land, to the other side of the river, to their possessions. It was the same nation, but different homes. Same God, but different tribes. Same goal, but different vantage points. And as they were being sent back home, they were reminded in verse number five, just make sure you love God and keep his word and serve him. And they said, we got you guys. Look, they still belonged to Israel. The two and a half, even though they were being moved to, even though they were being moved to, even though that they were being moved to a different location, they were still part of Israel. They still had the inheritance and they still had peace. They had the same mandate as everybody else. They were just being moved to a slightly different location. And when they arrived back in their land, they built an altar. But verse number nine tells us a cryptic, gives us a cryptic message to a misunderstanding that's about to happen because it says when they departed out of Shiloh. The word Shiloh means peace. So you have this illustration of their departing out of peace. They have peace. They're leaving peace. And there's this cryptic message that you're like, the winds have changed a little bit. Something's about to happen. And when they got back over to their homeland, they built an altar for the purposes of which I've already explained. 
Listen, they were moved, we're talking about movement. We're, they were moved by God in their position to the east side. And they were moved by God in their praise in the building of the altar. But these movements were about to lead to a big misunderstanding. Our personal movements may not always be understood. And our ministry movements may not always be understood. But don't let those who didn't die for you dictate your movements. I must say that again. And I've been preaching to y'all enough this week that I hope to get a couple more amens in your pastor on that one. Don't let those, you're my brothers and sisters. We're going to be sitting at the marriage supper of the Lamb one day. You and me, we're, we're going to be having the greatest party in heaven. You think that that youngin right there can sing good? You wait till we get to heaven. All of us are casting down crowns, trying not to hit each other in the toe with our crowns. Man, it's going to be great up there. So we better get used to hanging out with one another and agreeing. I'll say this again. Don't let those who didn't die for you dictate your movements. Christ died for you. You may have loyalty to people, but loyalty don't equal lordship. Move when God says move. And remember something about movements and misunderstandings. These movements were pure. These movements that we're hearing about, they were pure and they were sanctioned by God. They were not selfishly done. These people moved back over to the other side of the river, which, yes, led to a misunderstanding, but that wasn't their fault. They were sanctioned by God. They weren't selfish. And sometimes our movements are not pure or according to the Bible. And when someone calls us out on it, don't, don't play the martyr. Don't say, well, I'm just misunderstood. No, you're not. There's a big difference in doing right and being misunderstood and doing wrong and being called on the carpet for it. There's a huge difference. But I see the mercies of God, but then I see this movement that leads to, thirdly, a misunderstanding. Verses 11 through 20, when the tribes went back home, again, they stopped on the banks of the river and they built this incredible altar. They had been away from their kids for five years, like we said. They built the altar to make sure that the next generation could know the God of the former generation. This was a great move. Don't we want, even if we have to do things a little bit differently than the people of the former generation, whatever we have to do to reach this generation within the confines of Scripture, isn't that what we want? Well, this generation don't build like the former generation. Well, respectfully, when, when I look at our, <laughs> I always joke with our guys about our church building. The former generation built everything to last way too long, okay? If a, if a light fixture of the former generation falls out of the sky, we're having a funeral four days from now. They're too heavy. Nothing comes down. You try to peel one piece of paneling off the wall, the whole wall comes down. I mean, they glued everything. You can't take carpet up. The former generation was like, we're the last generation. Jesus is coming back. <laughs> so let's not, get in, let's not get into what the former generation does because us younger pastors are like, this carpet won't come up. This is, what do we do? And our budgets are three times the size because the former generation built with some crazy stuff, okay? So let's not get into that. And I can say this because I'm 12 hours away from my former generation, and they're probably not watching tonight because they should be in church, and they should not be on the phone watching their pastor right now. They should be listening to the other pastor. But even if the next generation before us, look, if my son becomes a pastor and he don't do it exactly like I do it, but he rejoices in the same Christ and he preaches the same gospel and he loves the same word and he tear da tears down the same idols and he builds the same altars, I could care less what his auditorium looks like. There's a, there's a bunch bigger things for me to get upset about. And this misunderstanding, they came over and they said, you're doing it a little bit differently. And it led to a misunderstanding. And immediately following, there was hearsay, hasty reactions, heavy-handed assumptions, and a history of hurt. I'll say that again. Misunderstanding. We need to learn to see when misunderstandings are brewing. Is there hearsay involved? 
He said, she said, they said, do what the Bible says in Matthew and go ask them. Did you say? I heard this. Did you say? Oh, you didn't? Well, cool, man. Love you. What if they lie to you? What if they do? I'm not their God. I did everything that I could to, squail the, to squash the misunderstanding. This he said, she said, they said, we said, these passive aggressive, kind of ambiguous, cloudy Facebook post of hearsay, let's just cut that out. It messes things up. There was hearsay and then there was hasty reactions. There was hasty reactions. There was, there was quick. It was a little too quick. A little too quick. There was heavy handed assumptions. But in those things, this history of hurt rises to the top. You see, Phineas, who's leading this, the most misunderstood dude in this story, he was a chief leader. You've got to listen to this. this is, there's a lot of wisdom in, here, in the word. He was a leader who had been around the block a time or two. He remembered the idolatry of yesteryear and the punishment that, that went with it. He was a soldier you'd want to go to war with. Not this one. But majority-wise speaking, he was someone you'd want by your side. He was commended by God in Numbers chapter 25. He's a good man. Good men can, can still usher in misunderstandings. And these new movements by the eastern tribes caused this old soldier some great concern. The chief leaders were not wrong in their desire to guard the nation against wickedness. They were not wrong... But they, oh, sorry, they were not wrong in desiring to guard the nation against wickedness, but they were wrong in their accusations and assumptions. They jumped to conclusions. They offered the east side to come over to their side before even hearing out the east side's position. Be very careful assuming that your side of the river is the only side doing it right. Be careful that assuming that your side of the river is the only side doing it right. Look, I, I promise you I'm not even bitter about this. I know I can be a little bit snarky, but that's more just to add some zest to my message to kind of keep you all engaged. I, if I was bitter, I wouldn't be pastoring right now, right? But I've seen this over and over and over and over and over, all these misunderstandings and these assumptions. And I'm, okay, so I'm 31 years old. Can I be honest with you? You know how many older, really good Christians I've had misunderstand me? Because of the way that I dress or the songs that I sing. That's, that promises song that I sing, the hand of God is on that song, but because it's not in the song book, you know how many older people would not like that song? Now, here's the thing. Oh, you were getting a little bit uncomfortable. The Bible is made to make you uncomfortable. Can we... Was the cross comfortable for Jesus? We want revival with comfortability. And we learned last night that's just not how it works. And I've had well-meaning people, but I can't look at those people and say, shut up, you're stupid, you don't know what you're talking about. Look, they may be ignorant in the sense of having, not having knowledge of what we're doing in this generation, but I want those people to guard. I want the old guard. I welcome that. So when one of my older deacons or elders walks up to me at my church and says, hey, can you explain a little bit more to me about why we're doing this? Absolutely. As much time as you need, let's do it, man. Because I want them to be on guard. They've been around the block. Those are our chief soldiers. I preach on the shoulders of those men and women. I want them. But we have to understand that yesteryear was not perfect. This generation's not perfect, and our future generation's not going to be perfect. And if we're not careful, we're just going to keep on pumping out and breeding Christians that misunderstand each other. We're going to be so daggum cross-eyed at each other, we can't see the gospel clearly. And that there's over 200,000 people dying and going to hell every single day. But you know what we're fighting over? We're fighting over how we build our altars. We're fighting over if we got pews or chairs. That's what we're fighting over. When there's people over in the Philippines sitting crisscross applesauce in the dirt tonight, and we fighting over, well, this cushion, you know what? This cushion just reminds me of the good old days. Well, you, let's just park there for just a second. You know how much stuff we're unraveling from the good old days? You know how much legalism we're unraveling in the Baptist church from the good old days today? 
So let's just hold up because maybe those pews didn't give us everything that we thought they were going to give us. But here's the thing. I'm not mad at people for believing that because I'm like, you've seen the wars. You've seen the death. I want that vantage point, but I also really desire your respect that I'm following the same God that you are. And if we have this mindset that we're on the same team, then God in his providence, God in his providence has put a river between these people. He was like, y'all on the same team, y'all in the same nation, but y'all can't go to church with each other. That's what God did. God put a river right down between them boys. Because he was like, y'all would eat each other alive. So you go to your corner and you go to your corner and stop looking over the river at each other and trying to figure out what they're doing wrong. Because when you're gazing over the river trying to look at what the eastern tribes are doing wrong, the, the enemy is eating up the western tribes. It's ridiculous what we allow into our church. And we want revival and we want the mercies and the goodness of God, but we have to stay sober and vigilant and circumspect because them little foxes with their tails on fire are going to make their way into our gatherings and into our midst, and they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna, uh, mar entire seasons of the church. They're going to be a spoke in the bicycle. You remember as a kid when you were just racing downhill, this is awesome. And one of those little idiots would stick a little broomstick and whoop, boom. That's what Satan does. Yeah, God's so good to us. Wham. And your teeth are going through your lips and stuff. People come into church and everybody's disfigured. Who did that? The church people. Because we misunderstand each other. We read this book through our lens. We read this book through our generation. Last time I checked, that word was forever settled in heaven before they started sprinkling sawdust. The old past that we, the old past that we talk about were in the no Old Testament thousands of years before the 60s, 70s, and 80s. We got to hold up on misunderstanding everybody. Eat me alive. Most of the stuff, most of the work we got to do as pastors and preachers. Sorry for slapping that. That was a little out of line. That was a little too much. I got a lot of energy in me right now. I'm so passionate about this. I'm so passionate about waking up people to the fact that you're on the same team. And just because God leads you to do certain movements in your position and your praise, good for you. As long as you keep loving God and serving Him and preaching the right word. Here's what the Bible says about hearsay. A forward man sows strife, and a whisperer separates chief friends. A flattering mouth works ruin. This is what the Bible says about haste. He that answers a matter before he hears it, it is a folly and a shame unto him. Ecclesiastes says, don't be rash with your mouth, and let not your heart be hasty to utter, utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and you're on earth. So let your words be few. Be not hasty in your spirit to be angry, for anger rests in the bosom of fools. Here's what the Bible says about assumption, assumptions, heavy-handed assumptions. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try those spirits, whether they're coming from God, because there's a lot of false prophets that are gone out into this world. But remember, I said that haste and hearsay and heavy-handed assumptions, while they're silly, while they rile me up, why I want to live my life in a way shaking the cage of Christianity saying, wake up. Why are we fighting over such silly, if I wear church socks or ankle socks to church, what are we doing here? Why are we fighting over such silly things? I want to live my life doing that. I also, in the other parts of my brain, realize that a lot of times people are hasty, say things and overreact because they have a history of hurt. And therein lies balance. Because we have to say that it is ridiculous to eat each other alive like this. But we also have to say, I wonder if those people are acting like that for a reason. Maybe they have a history of hurt. Maybe they're Phineas that has seen way too many friends die by getting it wrong. And so they may be a little quick to, to hastily assume what you're doing in your life is wrong, but hey, hey, calm down, calm down. Because they might be doing that, and they might be foolish, and it might be ridiculous, but that origin story 
might weave back to some real history of hurt. And that's why it, that's why it does, that's why the Bible says overcome evil with good. And when there is a misunderstanding and someone sits down with you and they have heavy, heavy handed assumptions, that's why it's not wise to return the favor with your heavy handed assumption about them. Because just like they don't know you and they're making hasty assumptions about you, you truly don't know them either. And maybe if, they, if you were to open up the doors of their life, you were to say, I'm so sorry you've been through that. I can understand. I, I get why that upset you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I offended you. And you can show grace because grace is how you diffuse misunderstandings. Phineas came over with his men, and this is so moving to me. And yes, to the face, it makes me want to slap a stool and say, what are you doing? But when you read Numbers 25, you're like, Phineas, I'm so sorry you went through that, man. I'm so sorry you had to do that. Here's something that we need to learn as Christians, and it really helps us out with misunderstandings. We need to learn to be scarred, not bruised. We need to learn to be scarred, not bruised. I got in a wreck and I have a scar right here. That doesn't hurt at all. It doesn't hurt at all. You get a nice little bruise right here and someone touches it. You flinch. Watch. Haste. Oh, hey, hey, well, watch out for that. We got people knocking into each other in churches these days. And because we're not allowing ourselves to be healed by the balm of Gilead, the Holy Ghost, because of a history of hurt, and we're holding on to things, the bruise just sits there and festers. And so when a pastor or someone or a Sunday school teacher or an authority gets up and makes the decision, hey, how dare you? Haste. Flinch. We have to learn in our, if we want to stay away from misunderstandings, don't be hasty. Don't give in to hearsay. Don't have heavy-handed assumptions. But also learn to heal. Christians need to learn to heal. My goodness, if I, if I stopped and told you, and I understand it's 8.15 and it's a school night. I'm trying to get done, but I do fly out really early in the morning, so if you're mad, I'm trying, though, I promise, okay. If I told you what, ha what has happened to my family in the last, not in the last 14 months, because my church has been the safest place for my family. I love my church. But if I could tell you what happened in the years leading up to being the pastor of that church, I don't know how I'm standing. Other than the fact that on July the 7th, when 24 hours after everything went down, and I didn't know who I could trust, and I didn't have a paycheck, and my network was compromised, and I was all alone, and I couldn't get out of the contract on my house, and so in a few weeks, I wouldn't have a roof over my kid's head. Because of what soldiers you don't need to go to battle with did to my family. As I sat under my crab apple tree, a 300 Stonewall Drive in Waynesboro, Virginia, July the 7th, 2021, the only thing I can account for is, Brother Drew, I don't know how it happened, but as a, as a bruised and hurting sheep, there was a faithful shepherd right there with me. And somehow he healed me. And I'll ask him about how it all happened when I get to heaven. But I learned a lesson. I've, I'm preaching to you tonight with a ton of scars, but no bruises. Hey, stop picking at your scabs. Stop reopening your own wounds. Wounds will happen, but festering doesn't have to. Rest and recoup when you get wounded. And let the shepherd do the work that he needs to do. Stop fighting the hands that are holding you. Surrender. 
I think that a lot of misunderstandings can be cut off at the head if we would just learn to heal, if we just learn to give grace and receive grace. If we would stop acting like we're okay, dragging around all the baggage, if we would stop putting on a brave face, because remember, God looks on the outside, but I mean, man looks on the outside, but God looks on the inside. He's the balm of Gilead for a reason. Pastor Drew, when Jesus left the Holy Ghost behind, he could have called him anything, but he called him the comforter. Could have called him anything. He called him the comforter. And when God is really, really good to you in your church, I, have, I had one more point, but I'm going to shut it down. When God is really, really good to you and your church and your family, don't let those blessings lull you to sleep. You be thankful. Don't be scared because only a wicked man looks over his shoulder when no man's pursuing, the Bible says. Don't be scared. Learn to trust. But be just a little bit more vigilant for misunderstandings. Because as you're bathing in the mercies of God, the devil just has a way of, and all of a sudden, well, how do I track them, Pastor? Hearsay? How quick were they to this moment? Is this a little heavy-handed? It may be, and they may be wrong. Pray for them. But is there a history of hurt? in the person that's doing it to you and in you, is there a history of hurt? Because in the same way that you need to learn to understand, understand other people and their hurt, it's about time some of us just looked in the mirror and fully grasped our hurt. Stop trying to be, look, Jesus took everything for you on the cross. That's why he said, come unto me, all you that are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Cast all your cares upon me, for I care for you. Stop trying to impress God with your strength. You're limping. You're allowing misunderstandings to rule your life. You just need to sit down for a little while under your crabapple tree and let the shepherd heal you. Receive the grace that he has for you tonight. And if you can do that, you can be healed. The Bible says, Him that has been, he that has been forgiven much, oh, he will forgive much. To the person who's been loved much, he will love much. And if you allow yourself to be healed much, you know what's going to happen? You're going to turn into a healer and someone who's a lot more capable at diffusing misunderstandings. Hey, I've been where you are. Let's go out for coffee. Let's just talk about it real quick, okay? Hey, look, look, we're brothers and sisters. <laughs> You're fine. We're on the same team here. We're on the same team. I'm sorry if I did that. It's, it's cool. But if you're always bruised up, well, hey, why are you touching my bruise? They may have just accidentally bumped into your bruise. We've got to learn to heal and give the grace that we desperately desire. And my hope for y'all, Faith Baptist Church, is as God leads you into this next season of revival, and he's oh so good to you, and I know that he's going to be because you're in good care with Christ and with the whites. As God does some great things in y'all, watch out for those disciple disputes. Pick who you go to battle with. And learn what misunderstandings are and how they come and diffuse them with grace. And if you can do that, I'm telling you, this, this county's never seen a church about what's going to happen in faith. Every head bowed and every eye closed. And if you don't mind, I'm going to take a little liberty here. And I'm, I'm going to ask the music team not to come. I'm just going to ask Pastor Drew to come. I'm going to ask for the music team to actually hold off from singing. I definitely know the Lord's been working on hearts, and so I'm not going to belabor anything. I'm just going to say that the altar is open, and your pastor is up here, and under shepherd is up here, and if you need to pray with him, he's up here. If you need to pray yourself, as we close down revival, fall revival 2022, I would challenge all of us in this room to come find a spot at this altar, every one of us, to come find a spot at this altar and say, God, help me to be vigilant 
as you're taking us into this new season of revival and health and fruit and growth, help me to be the soldier I need to be. We're not going to play any music. We're just going to keep it as quiet as we possibly can and let people come. So would you respond to the challenge? Stand up right where you are and come find a spot here at this altar. If you need to pray with Pastor Drew or his wife, grab them. My wife and I will help with their kids. And let's just pray and seek the face of the Lord tonight. Wow. I don't know about you, what a fitting way to end revival. And, uh, you know, what a touching message that was tonight. And, you know, that that's the truth is we're all dealing with hurt. We're all dealing with wounds. We all, uh, and maybe even tonight you discovered some new ones. Maybe you thought, well, I thought I was done with that. I thought that was in the past. And where you thought maybe there was a scar, you realized, well, that was just a scab that's been there a really long time. And it's it's not healed yet. And uh, my prayer is that you have dealt with that tonight with God. If you didn't, if you have buried it and just tried to keep, you know, I'm just going to keep on, keep on with it, take care of that tonight. Take care of that tonight because you don't have to go around wounded. We don't. We have a Savior who is our healer. What a precious promise that is. What, a, what an attribute of God, you know, that he would come and heal us where we are, where we cannot heal ourselves. What an amazing God that is. Uh, gentlemen, we're going to take up a love offering if we can at this time. One final one. and.
I know we've been asking this every night, and it's not to drain your pockets or put any pressure on you, but again, this is solely for Brother Levi and his family and just a way that uh, we at FBC can say thank you for coming here and leaving, you know, where your safe place right now, those people who mean everything to you, and uh, coming down here for just a few days for us to pour into us, pour into me and our family, and uh, what a blessing that you are and your family are, and so... Um, We'll ask that uh, tonight, one, one final, if God has laid anything on your heart, and then it'll pass. Also, if you were a guest here, you had a prayer uh, need that you were able to fill out on that card, this will be the time where you can drop that in, and those will all come to me, and I will uh, get with you and deal with those um, as soon as we can. But uh, one final time tonight, let's pray and uh, go before the Lord, ask him to bless this money and uh, bless the Smith family as well. Father, we are so thankful for how you move in our hearts. We are so thankful for healing. We are so thankful uh, Lord, that you would come right beside us and guide us through the murkiest, water, uh, murkiest waters and the muddiest pits of life, Lord, and you would get us out of them. We thank you for who you are. Lord, I ask that you uh, bless the Smith family tonight, Lord, and I just uh, ask that uh, this gift that we'll be giving them tonight. Lord, we'll just be a blessing to their family, Lord. And uh, we just thank you for, again, allowing uh, this whole meeting to transpire this week and help us to uh, carry this for weeks on out, Lord, that this will help us to continue to heal, help us to continue to draw near to you, uh, Lord, and uh, just to look to you when we deal with these uh, difficult circumstances that come about in life. We thank you, Lord, for all of those that are here and for the generous gifts that have been given this week. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Really, I just uh, announcement wise, and, and just a, a way again of saying thank you uh, to all of you. Thank you to all of you who have helped make this happen. There's no way my wife and I could do all of this, uh, and, and so for all of who have helped clean up, who have helped uh, bring meals, who have helped just me at coming up and just saying, pastors, or anything that you need or anything I can do for you, thank you. And uh, so what a blessing it is to have our our core church body who comes alongside and really is the feet and hands of Christ. Just ask that you be in prayer about Sunday morning. Uh, that'll be the next time we gather. I am pumped. We are getting into a new series, and we're going to go expositionally, verse by verse, through the book of 1 Peter. It's very heavy hitting. Sunday is going to be very heavy hitting. We need heavy hitting. Amen. We need, to, we need to learn doctrine. We need to learn what the Word says. And 1 Peter is going to be a very encouraging book for that. And the title of the whole series is Our Living Hope. We, we're going to sing that song on Sunday morning that Phil Wickham does. I love it because we don't serve a dead hope. We don't serve just a hope of the past or some fable. Our hope, who is Jesus Christ, is very much alive. And that's what we're going to discuss and celebrate on Sunday. So I hope that you'll be in prayer this week. I'm praying for all of you that you will have a wonderful, blessed uh, rest of the week. Let's all stand, and I'd like to uh, say our verse of the month one last time this week before we meet again on the Lord's Day. And if you will say it with me in a loud and bold voice, Psalms 85.6. Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? We love you. You're dismissed. Have a wonderful night.